Good morning. Good to see everyone out this morning. Despite the, the scare that's out there of the pandemic and health concerns of many of our members, it's nice to see everyone out. And due to that, there will be a meeting of the men afterwards to discuss uh, future plans for the evening services and Bible classes. And so look forward to those updates coming soon. Tonight, we had planned a theme, song and scripture service themed around Faith is the Victory. And when I was putting that together, I thought it'd be fun to do a hymn study this morning. So this morning's lesson is entitled, The Darkest Night. And we're going to do something a little different. This is a going to be a song that was typically sung right before the Lord's Supper. So we're going to carry on the thoughts that Grant laid the groundwork in on the, his talk of the Lord's Supper. I really enjoyed listening to him and the thoughts that he asked us to consider are great indeed that Jesus not only was nailed to the cross but had to carry his cross and then asks us as his followers to pick up our crosses and follow him and so we're going to be carrying on the theme of thinking of the Lord's Supper topic tonight this morning as we talk about the darkest night and then I've asked Leon to lead us in singing Night with Evan Pinion as our invitation song. It's not typically an invitation song, but hopefully after we talk about these things this morning, it will be on our minds. There's a great many things we're going to be looking at as far as the text goes. Isaiah 53, 3-5, Mark 14, 32-42, and Luke 22, 43-44, all will kind of lend aid in talking about the darkest night. One of the reasons this was on my mind was recently I saw a post from a place called Crosswalk.com that one of our members shared talking about 10 Christian hymns that need to be put to rest written by Jennifer Waddle and it was dated April 19, 2018. And as you read through her reasons that these 10 songs need to be discarded, her, the, the main problem with her list of 10 was outdated language. She said, these aren't songs we can sing anymore because we don't understand what they mean unless we've got a dictionary in the pews to go along with our Bibles. Well, while Night with Evan Pinion did not end up on her list, there are a great many of the comments that I saw that said it should have been on that list instead of some of the other ones that she had chosen. Not only that, I found another thing called the Song Police and in that list of our, that article, there was opposition made that we shouldn't sing Night with Evan Pinion for a host of reasons. One of those is nobody knows what an Evan or Pinion is and why does it brood over the veil. So that led me to, as I was researching that, I saw a preacher once asked, what or who is Evan Pinion and how does it brood over the veil? Now to this preacher's credit, he's a, a turns out he was a friend of mine. He went on to describe what I'm going to describe for you. So there is no confusion what an Evan Pinion is, and how it broods over the veil. So my answer to these things of why should we sing these songs because we don't understand what's there, my answer is we should sing those hymns and maybe it ought to make us understand the words that we're singing. And so that's part of what we're going to be looking at this morning. Instead of ridding ourselves of hymns with words we don't understand, let us strive to see the meaning and get the great picture that these ancient words of poetry paint for us. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 15, What is the outcome then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the mind also. What he's saying is, we need to sing with the understanding. We do need to understand the words that we're singing, else we can't really sing them and mean them if we don't understand. I remember being in a meeting long ago, uh, when I was a late teen, I believe I was 19, and we were, had a teen gathering all together and we were singing, uh, We Saw Thee Not. And when we got to the words, I don't remember which stanza it's in, but it says he prostrated himself. At the end of that hymn, someone said, what does that mean? My dad has pro problems with his prostate. Did Jesus have that problem too? And we were like, read the word again. <laughs> so then we describe what prostrate means. It means to fall down on one's face. It's more than just bowing. It is laying flat out generally, laying down on your face. And so we need to understand the words that we're singing. One of these hymns that has these ancient outdated words that some say is Night with Evan Pinion. I'm going to tell you the lyrics were written by Love H. Jameson. He lived from 1811 to 1892. He was a contemporary of Alexander Campbell during the Restoration Movement. This hymn was first published in 1854 
but the circumstances of its origin are unknown. But we do know he also authored the well-known hymn, There is a Habitation. So he's a a well-known author to us as far as hymns that we know and love. The tune is called Sorrows, or Eben Pinion, and it was composed by Joseph P. Powell, who lived from 1830 to 1926. He was identified with Christian churches. He taught vocal music until after 1855. And again, the date and circumstances of this tune are unknown. But we often sing this during the Lord's Supper, and I would say rightly so. It paints a vivid picture of the night Jesus was betrayed in the garden before being handed over to die for the sins of the world. The Lord's Supper is a memorial we partake of every first day of the week to remember Christ's death and sacrifice till He comes again as He directed, as Paul paints this picture for us in 1 Corinthians 11, 23-26. He says, I received this from the Lord. He wasn't there that night it happened. He says, I received it directly from Jesus of what it was and what we're intended to think about and do while we partake of it. Knowledge of and personal application to His death makes us obedient to His Word when we think about what He went through. When we think about the heaviness of that cross, how it would be 100 pounds or 300 pounds when we're healthy might be difficult, let alone when we're beaten to within an inch of our lives. Having been beaten, scourged, his robe ripped on and off, reopening wounds, and then made to walk that street in shame through Jerusalem to outside the city gates to the place of execution. When we think about those things, and these are certainly thoughts that we ought to think about all the time, but especially every first day of the week as it focuses our mind to think about what our Savior went through for us. Is certainly appropriate as we partake of the Lord's Supper. It will strengthen our resolve to live faithfully to Him and His will for our lives. And it's right that we do it on the first day of the week. As we can see the example in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. As we can see the example in 1 Corinthians 11 and 16 when they came together as the church. And chapter 16 verse 1 tells us it was on the first day of the week because it helps focus our mind on those things. In John 3 and verse 16, It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Think about that word gave and how it encompasses so much. How it says so much of the gospel record of His trial and His crucifixion in that one word, gave. Betrayed by one of His own and delivered to the Jews. This was one of His friends. Nobody suspected Judas... It's an amazing thing as you read through that Last Supper. And you see Jesus tell Judas, what you do, do it quickly. And Judas gets up and leaves during the supper and the disciples are sitting around saying, he must be going taking money to the poor. And then when Jesus says, one of you is betraying me, and he already pointed to Judas, remember what they did? Lord, is it I? Is it me? Am I the one? Nobody suspected it was Judas. He wasn't the guy with that dark cloud hanging over his head. He was the guy everybody trusted. They trusted him with their money. They trusted that he had good intentions toward the poor. Betrayed by one of his own. That's what makes betrayal so difficult to understand and accept. Because it's often not by the people you would suspect. It's by the people you trust. He appeared before Annas, Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, Herod, and Pilate. Every one of these men had it in their right and rule to release him. And every one of these men condemned him. Pilate announced numerous times, six times through Luke chapter 23, that he was innocent. And yet he handed him over to be scourged. And he delivered them over to do as they pleased and had him crucified. Why? Hebrews 2.9 tells us that he might taste death for everyone. He took our sins. He nailed them to the cross in His own blood. The night Jesus was betrayed could be called humanity's darkest night. Whether it was, whether or not it was physically dark, it was morally dark with sin. And it could also be said to be dark for Jesus as He knew what was about to befall Him. And yet He was willing to see it through to the morning of that third day. 
So let's direct our minds to Isaiah 53, 3-5 and talk about Christ, the man of sorrows. In Isaiah 53, 3-5 says, He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And remember, as Isaiah is writing, this is hundreds of years. Could be up to 750 years before this even happened. And he's talking about it as if it's already said and done. Because when God says it's going to happen, it will happen. He says, He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, He was despised, and we did not esteem Him. Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Grant asked the question, how heavy was the cross? It wasn't just the physical weight. He bore our sorrows. He bore our sins. It says in verse 4, Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Remember as He hung there, even the two men, the two thieves that hung on either side, as the people walked by, they shook their heads and they hissed and they mocked Him. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. Verse 5. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. And by His scourging, we are healed. Jesus was about to suffer punishment even though He was sinless. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Verse 5 says, For any man, even a man who is God, this would be something that weighed heavily upon his mind. And certainly as we get to the garden scene, that is the case. We turn this, we're going to sing the song in just a few minutes, Night with Evan Pinion. And we're going to read the words, Night with Evan Pinion, Brooded or the Veil. Just to break it down a little bit, Evan means black. It refers to something black or very dark. The word ebony refers to a heavy blackish wood from various tropical trees. Pinion has... Various meanings, but it means a wing. But if you have an engineering background, you might be thinking of some type of gear. That's not what the thought here is. The pinion in this song is referring to the pinion joint and the wing of a bird. The other way it's called is the flight wing. It's the wing that gives flight to the bird. If you clip the pinion wing, the bird can't fly. And thus, there's no escape. So pinion as a metaphor means to bind, to shackle, to confine or prevent escape. The picture painted here is of a flock of blackbirds flying overhead, covering the one weeping in sorrow. Eben Pinion put together could be a metaphor for a night of dark confinement. A dark a night of dark confinement. I want you to think about that, of what that meant for Jesus. He was praying to God, if your will be done, or if you will, let this cup pass from me, but not my will be done, your will be done. This was going to be a night of no escape. He was going to be taken into custody. He was going to go through a mock trial all through the night with no sleep. He was going to be beaten and scourged and by early morning crucified at Calvary. There was no escape. This was a night of dark confinement. This was a night that was going to be dark for him. Brooded is the verb form of the word brood which is how it's used in this song, refers to the act of caring or incubating as it is used of a bird. It can be said that an example is how a chicken sits on her eggs or how a bird will cover her young with her wing. It has many meanings, but the thought in this hymn seems to be the dark night hovered closely over the place which the context suggests is the Garden of Gethsemane in the Valley of Kidron. So the Kidron Valley, that's the veil. Veil is short for valley. So this verse paints the picture of darkness and silence and as we're going to sing the song except for the night wind wail. In that lonely setting, Jesus in profound sorrow intensely prayed, completely overcome with emotion and exhaustion. We read that He was prostrate on the ground before His Father. The song conveys the thought that this night was figuratively the darkest night. The night that death loomed over the sinless Son of God. The night, we could also say it, the night that was as dark as the wing of a blackbird covered the Kidron Valley. That would be another way that we could sing this hymn. And it tells us in Mark 14, 32-34, that Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to the Garden of Gethsemane 
to pray. And he's going to say, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. It says in verse 32, they came to a place named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. Perhaps they've never seen him this despondent. Perhaps they never saw him this overcome with emotion. And they didn't know what to do about it. Because he's going to ask them to sit here and to watch and to keep watch with him as he prays. And he goes a distance from them. We're going to see in the Luke account that it says he went a stone's throw away from them. Probably within sight. And he asked them to watch, but he says, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. It tells us, as we're going to sing this hymn, that it was in tears and sweat as blood. Luke 22, 43 to 44, Jesus prayed fervently. It says, being in agony, he was praying very fervently. Verse 43 says, now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. His sweat became like drops of blood. Not blood, but as drops of blood. Large sweat drops. Note the agony denotes, according to Vines, severe emotional strain and anguish. Have you ever been in severe emotional strain and anguish? It just affects your whole body. It affects your mind. It affects your soul. It affects your body. You become weak. It's hard to concentrate on anything else than what's happening. And Jesus here is praying, it says, very fervently. This picture in our minds of the place where our Lord spent His last few moments of freedom before His death. And it ought to create within us this solemn mindset as we sing a hymn such as this. And so it's right and fitting that we do so before the Lord's Supper, and that's not going to happen this morning. But I want us to consider the thoughts that we were led in thinking at the Lord's Supper the grave weight of that cross on his back and on his shoulders. And here we can read even before that happened, the agony, the stress, and the sorrow that he was experiencing. Christ, the man of sorrows on that darkest night, prostrated himself humbly in prayer. But we also see as we continue singing this hymn that Jesus prayed alone, it says, All around was silent, save the night wind's wail. The Scriptures tell us He prayed alone. Some have argued that since the Bible does not specifically say anything about a wind or silence, that we should not sing it. We need to understand with some of these hymns, poetic license is taken. But what we do know is that we can infer that since Jesus went late at night to a place quite apart from the normal avenues of human traffic and activity, undoubtedly so that He could spend and concentrate His time in prayer without distractions. It must have been fairly quiet. Judas knew the place well because he's going to be leading a cohort of soldiers to come arrest him. In Mark 14, 37 to 42, we read the Scriptures tell us he prayed alone. Three times he left his apostles. Luke 22, 41 says he went a stone's throw away to be by himself. And Luke records that that was so he could go away and be alone in prayer. The apostles slept while Jesus wept. And prayed. You can look in Hebrews 5 7, and it tells us that Jesus' praying was accompanied with tears, that he wept as he prayed. And so we sing, He for our transgressions had to weep alone. No friend with words to comfort, nor hand to help was there. No, we live in uncertain times. We live in scary times. We live in times where there is great concern for health, there's great concern for others. That's why we have taken the steps necessary to ensure that others' minds are put at ease. Jesus didn't have someone there to put his mind at ease. In fact, in one of the accounts when he told the apostles what was going to happen, remember what Peter said? He didn't lay a hand on him reassuringly. He said, no, Lord, that will never happen to you. And he had to say, get behind me, Satan. Remember that? He had to rebuke him. And here as it's about to happen the three of his closest friends that he's brought in this moment of trial. They're at a distance. And instead of keeping watch and praying on his behalf, they're sleeping. 
Now, we often ask one another to pray on our behalf. And the hope is, is that we don't go home and forget about them in our own prayers, but that we remember them and say a prayer for them. Here, Jesus asked three men who were right there with Him, a stone's throw away, and they couldn't keep watch. And He had to keep waking them up. Jesus was suffering for the offenses which were not His own. 1 Peter 3.18 says, "...the just for the unjust." His suffering was so intense that it says he was weeping as a result in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7. And what made it even worse was he had no human friend with words to comfort. No hand to help was there because even his closest disciples slept. We can see that in Matthew 26, 36 to 45. Mark records it in Mark 14, 37 to 42. At his darkest hour, when the future was certain, His apostles might not have known what was going to happen, but Jesus knew. He knew all that was about to befall Him. He knew there was no escape from this night, but He would be delivered over and He would suffer for the sins of the world. Jesus didn't just fret and worry Himself to death. Sometimes we do over problems we encounter, but He humbly bowed His head. He prostrated Himself in prayer. In our darkest hour of night, In our darkest night, with no human friends to comfort, we can turn to God in prayer, following the example of our Lord and Savior. But we see that Christ accepted God's will. He does pray in Mark 14, 35 to 36, Let this cup of anguish pass from me, I pray. And as we're about to sing, it says, Yet if it must be suffered by me, thine only Son, Abba, Father, Father, let thy will be done. Mark 14, 35 to 36. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus resigned himself to God's will. And so we can see in Philippians 2, starting in verse 5 all the way through 8, It actually begins in verse 3 as it tells us not to be selfish, not to just think of ourselves, but think of others. And then says in verse 5, have this attitude or this mind in yourselves that was in Christ. He didn't think of just himself. He thought of us. He thought of even those who were nailing him to that cross. And he put himself in God's hands, the just for the unjust. He asked God if it was possible to not go through what was about to come, but if not possible, not what He wanted, but what God's will be done. And He accepted God's answer. We need to be able to accept His answer as well. Romans 8.28 tells us, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. We may not always see the good right away. In fact, it might seem like God did not answer our prayer. But very often... Even when we go through something trying and we come out on the other end, our faith is stronger for it, as James chapter 1 tells us, starting in verse 2. And we can see the blessings that God has given. Here he refers to God as Abba. This is an Aramaic word for father, especially used as a term of endearment by a small child who might say daddy or papa. You can see other places of this in Mark 14, 36. You can see in Romans 8, 14 to 17. That we're called fellow heirs of Christ, that as Christians, we have the ability to cry out to God, Abba, Father. We have that relationship with Him because of what Jesus accomplished. Galatians 4 6 also says that. 1 John 3 1 refers to us as little children. And Hebrews chapter 12, 1 to 3. We don't have time to read this this morning, but in Hebrews 12, 1 to 3, it says, For the joy set before Him. He endured the cross. He said, Consider the hostility toward Jesus by sinners. And for the joy set before Him, He endured the cross. Jesus looked beyond Gethsemane. And what an important part of the story of Gethsemane. Because in Gethsemane we see Him in anguish, grieved to the point of death. Mark 14, 34, it says He was in agony to the point of death. And here we see, for the joy set before Him, He endured the cross. We might ask at this point, why? What joy was there? What was in it that He could be joyful about? 
Here the Creator was so concerned about us, the created, that He endured the cross so we might not lose heart and that we might be comforted. 1 Peter 5, 6-7 says, He wants us to lay our cares, our anxieties on Him. Just as we see Jesus doing in the garden as our example, it says, lay our cares on Him because He cares for us. Just as He was faithful to the Father in the face of the cross, so we too must be willing to pick up our cross and remain faithful to God in all circumstances. No matter how heavy that cross might be, whatever that cross is that we're called to bear, don't let anything hinder you from serving God. We need to do as Jesus did, put our faith in God. We must be willing to pick up our cross and follow Him. This hymn, Night with Evan Pinion, to me serves as a powerful reminder of the faithfulness of Jesus and how we can have that same faith in us as well. Because for our sins, the sinless Lamb, out of love for you and me, died for you and me. The hymn, Evan Pinion, is a fitting song to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. And if we comprehend and understand and contemplate its meaning, it gives us great mental aid and preparation for it, and it reminds us of God's great love for every single one of us. There wasn't only physical darkness that dark night of Jesus' betrayal, but a spiritual darkness, and that it was for the sins of the world that the spotless Lamb of God was going to die in our stead. He was going to be that sacrifice. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews 8 through 10 tells us about how his sacrifice was far better than the sacrifices of the old covenant. How that new covenant was enacted in his death. And by his death on the cross, he sacrificed for sins once, for all time, for all sins. And justified the many. Brethren, you and I have been justified through his blood because of his willingness to go through that darkest night because of the hope that it brings. As we sing the words of this hymn, we should feel the darkness of the night. We ought to feel the chill of the wind as Jesus fervently prayed without any earthly friend. We should feel sadness as we consider He was receiving the wages for our sin. We know in Ephesians 6.20 or Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And while there it talks about an eternal death, the second death, Jesus took on that physical death, that manifestation of what we deserved, having no guilt of His own. As we sing this hymn, we should see His ultimate example of submissive obedience, that when we read Philippians 2, 5-11, to and it says, have this attitude in yourselves, we can know fully what that means and comprehend that as we go through our lives this next week. We should be both awestruck and we should be zealous to emulate His example, to let His light shine in us that others might see it. From Philippians 2, 5-11 to and Hebrews 5, 8-9. to But also as we sing this hymn, we need to be reminded the darkest night is temporary. The darkest night, our darkest trials are temporary. Even if it requires our lives, there will be a bright and glorious morning. And for Jesus, that happened. From the darkest night came the brightest day when the news spread through all Jerusalem. There was an empty tomb. Jesus rose from the dead. This was the talk of the town. You find people on the road to Emmaus saying to Jesus, Are you a stranger here and you don't know what's happened? Many people went to the tomb and found it just as the women said, empty. And the women said, We don't know where he's, we don't know where he's at. From the darkest night came the brightest morning when Jesus rose from the dead. From His death and His resurrection, He now sits at the right hand of God. Philippians 2.9 says, Exalted above every name. Acts 4.12 says, No other name under heaven can men be saved in, but yet Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Going back to verse 10. And brethren, we need to learn from this example that He can turn your dark night into brightest day, knowing that He awaits the faithful in a home that he has gone forward ahead to prepare. So the question this morning we ought to all be asking ourselves is have you obeyed the gospel? Have you put on Jesus Christ in baptism? Have you made his attributes yours? Have you clothed yourselves with him? Have you become a fellow heir of heaven 
Romans 8.17 tells us it's possible we can cry out, Abba, Father, to our great and almighty God. And if you are not a Christian this morning, you need to be. Or you are subject to His judgment. And that darkest night will only get darker. You need to become a Christian. Knowing that Jesus died to give you the opportunity to become a child of God. John chapter 1 and verse 12. That you can have that hope of that brightest morning. Better than any day you'll ever experience in this life. To become a Christian. To repent and be baptized. And this morning, if you are a Christian with unrepented sin, or you're not living the way that you should, or you're struggling with sin in your life, you don't need to struggle alone. We're here for you. God is there for you. Jesus promised in Hebrews 13, 5, He'll never forsake us nor desert us. And that's a promise that we need to hang our hats on. And this morning, if you have unrepented sin, or you're struggling and you wish for the prayers of the congregation, don't hesitate to ask. And we're ready to assist you in the waters of baptism or the prayers on your behalf. Just come forward and let your request be known known now while together we stand.